Okay, great. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, yes, I'm Judy from Inventfin Foods and my broader team is also here. Bernard is here. And where's everyone else gone? Um, they're taking a tour, I suppose. But we'll introduce them when they, when they come round. Okay, so Inventfin Foods is a small part of a company called Inventfin, which is the investment arm of um, Remgro. We're based here in Stellenbosch. And Inventfin Foods was started in September last year. We um, have a share in, or we've invested in Boss Ice Tea. It's one of our most famous investments. And um, we'll talk about some of the other investments a little bit down the line. Um, my team is here. They, everyone who works in Inventfin Foods is here. We have Bernard, who heads up um, new um, business, or really is our scout and looks for new business. We have Theo and Rahim, they're also here somewhere, who do all of our research. Um, and there are a few others as well. What we, um, we're going to talk about our investment rationale throughout the presentation that we do. But our, um, the way that we look at investments is really, we look for innovation, we look for scalability, but really we're looking to build brand value. So, um, that's what Remgro is all about. We are about premium brands. We have, we have that in our stable and that's what we're looking for. Innovation, incubation and to build those premium, possibly global brands. So we need to find out what we want to invest in. We need to understand what landscape, we need to make decisions about investments. So one of the biggest things that we do is we track trends. We track um, consumer trends, food trends, new products. We look at pull through of products. We look at um, what deal activity is being done in the foods business. And those, all of that kind of information gives us the ability to understand what we should be investing in. So when we started Inventment Foods in September, Bernard and I were given the task to put a line in the sand and say, these are the definitive trends. So we did that. By about February, we put together a trends presentation, which looked at what's happening in the foods landscape. So I'm going to share that with you today because it shows you, it was almost a, well, eight months ago, you're going to see what we saw then and what has actually materialized. And I'm going to take you through the journey of how we actually do this. And throughout this time that we're looking at the trends, you can jot down some questions if you want, but you'll see as we build this presentation that some of the, some of the um, premises that we put down in the beginning will get answered later. So let's have the Q&A afterwards because I may, I may put something down and think, oh, no, and then you'll see something about it later. So it'll build. Um, we're also going to just talk, we're going to give you quite a lot of examples and rationales of what we see as benchmarks which will talk to, which will, we can then share with you the way we think and the way we look at food products. Um, and I'm going to do that through example rather because it's, you know, we can stand up here and say we, we do this, we do that, we do that. But you'll see through the way we, the eyes that we look at products and the way we look at companies and the way we look at entrepreneurs and the benchmarks that we've chosen, you'll see the way we think. So the big team is here, everybody's here. I also want to introduce you to Johannes Schuler. It's one of our newest investments. Le Bonbon is a is an artisanal candy company. They make beautifully handcrafted sweets, and most of the beautiful sweets that you see in Woolworths is made by them. So that's one of our investment companies as well. Okay, so I'm going to take you through our food trends um, first, and then I'm going to have a quick break, and I'm going to swap over to another presentation, which cements some of the stuff, and then we're going to do some Q&A. Okay. Um, should I, or can you all see me? Should I sit down rather? Okay. So what we've done is to pull all of this clutter of information together, we've tried to put it into some order. And we've pulled out three what we call super trends. Now a lot of this you will know, but we're going to show you how it manifests in food. And then we need to look at drivers, drivers and enablers. They are, are the things that we look at that make a trend come into your space, that make the consumer have a look at it. Why is it, it may be a trend, but who's actually noticing? So what are the drivers that make people notice? So there's three big trends. Health and wellness, we all know that. It's overarching, it's there. We call it snackification because it's just mushrooming as well. And craftisanal, which is craft and artisanal, 
but we want to add a bit of tech to that because we've got to scale craft. So health and wellness, I'm just going to quickly go through this. We all know that it's firmly entrenched as long term. It's at the heart of a cultural movement. Um, everybody is taking health and wellness seriously. They're thinking about what they're putting into their bodies. They're measuring what they do. They want food to perform for them. So that we've taken health and wellness and looked at it in different chapters, which I'll take you through now. Um, some of the products that you see, if I don't touch on them now, I will touch on them later because there's a story behind them. They're just illustrative at the moment. The first big chapter we look at is free from. Everybody wanted to get rid of wheat, gluten. Sugar is a hugely emotive and publicized issue at the moment. GMO additives and preservatives. So what we've tried to do is say, right, that's the trend. Let's see how it's manifested. Um, You'll see we, we picked ancient grains as something that was going to come forward about eight months ago because it's wheat free, it's gluten free, and it's high protein. So people are going to latch onto that and start doing products, using products. It's, it's about taking um, the contrived gluten free products that are, are, were in the past and making them more naturally now. We've also seen a further development in sprouted ancient grains. So taking sprouted pro um, sprout grains, mm -hmm. sprouting them, unlocking the nutrients and grinding it into flour and making products out of that. So these are examples here of products that are free from. Good indulgence, we all know the Tim Noakes, less carbohydrates, more fat. This has come out. Some of the products that have come in here, coconut oil, we know Woolworths have launched their whole Carb Clever range and low-carb, high-fat meals are coming onto the horizon. Chobani is a full-fat Greek yogurt. It's a great brand story. I'm going to touch on it a bit later. I don't know if you, any of you know the Chobani Greek yogurts from the States. High protein. It's every, again, the whole Banting paleo movement is looking at high protein. Then the twist came. It should be sustainable. We can't eat every cow and every chicken that's out there. We're going to run out. So. People are starting to look at plant proteins and insect proteins. Um, the one on the left, which is a product called Just Mayo, is an interesting one because there's been a lot of investment activity here. So a company in the States called Hampton Creek um, developed a mayo with no egg and launched it in the States. They used plant protein and Unilever went ballistic because they went and said that the Traditional classification for mayonnaise in the States has egg in it. You can't come and take market share from us with a product that doesn't have egg. And there was a lot of, um, law, even lawsuits that went on around this. Unilever lost, and Just Mayo is really, really uh, got a lot of traction at the moment. They've also done a cookie dough with no egg and a couple of other products as well. So a really entrepreneurial, feisty bunch that did that. Cricket flour. Anybody want to eat a biscuit with cricket flour? We know Mopani worms. Insect protein is huge. It's coming in. It will start become, come, becoming part of products. Much more protein than a chicken breast. Everything that happens today is pushed down to kids. Parents are taking a lot more responsibility for what their kids are eating. So we need to take all of these trends down to snacking and kids' lunch boxes. It's all there. Built-in nutrition. You've all heard of superfoods. People are wanting what they eat to actually give them a lot more than just protein, carbohydrates, and, and what they need. They're actually wanting to have um, increased performance from what they're eating. Here are some examples of products with, a, with those kind of values. This is an interesting one for us because we like to understand that we're investing in something that has scale. And a lot of short life product that has to be produced every day and only has five or six days life is difficult to scale internationally. So we're always interested in something that tastes fresh and is perceived as fresh, but has a shelf life of maybe two months, three months, even six months. So there's a lot of technology out there now that's looking at preserving food and giving it life, but not necessarily giving it that long life taste or that overcooked UHT style taste. It's actually retaining the freshness. Cold pressed, no heat, and some, of, some other technologies that are being applied here. Which means that you can ship or transport a product through a normal supply chain, but you can sell it as chilled. 
or you can sell it and it, its perception is fresh. We all know this, it's all about absolute transparency, clear messaging, clean messaging, traceability, environmental awareness, sustainability messaging, recycling. Here's one of the bigger brands that have taken that to the nth degree. It's, it's what everybody wants to see now, a, full, a completely transparent product. Good digestion, good guts, good health. This is very much on the horizon. I don't know if any of you have ever tasted drinking vinegar. Okay, it's out there. People are actually having a bottle of, instead of drinking water, they're drinking vinegar. And it's, it's refreshing and it's, it's got a lot of cleansing. Bone broth. Um, we went to a festival at Spear last week, the Secret Festival. What did we see there? Drinking vinegar, bone broth. It's come out. Um, kombucha. You see it around now, it's also gut health. So there's a lot of products coming in where people are trying to take care of their digestive system. Right, now we're moving on to snackification. Food trucks, snacks. Everybody's not sitting down and eating. They're moving around. They're constantly grazing. They're standing and eating. They're putting something in their handbag and having it. That's what it's all about. The opportunities to make something that is nutritious and portable is there. So we've looked at some chapters here. Um, I'll take you through them. Grazing on the go, um, just different snacking opportunities, breakfast being a very big one, hummus, high protein, also a very big one, pro bar, a whole meal in a bar, all of these things, of portion control, healthy snacking. Immediate consumption, it's got to be ready to eat, not microwave, got to microwave it, got to do this, got to do that. It's got to be delicious and ready to eat and give you everything you want. Okay, craftisanal. This <clears throat> for us is a very, very interesting part of what we are looking for. We are looking for the passionate entrepreneur that has put something together that has history, backstory, there's, there's something that is valuable in this and it's marketable and it's brand worthy and it's grown organically. In, in other words, they've you know, people have just reinvested and reinvested and put something together. It's passion that has stood the test of time and put a product out there. That's really what is there. And if you take this as an example, this is Manuka honey. It's actually from New Zealand. It's tiny. It's um, only from a certain bush. It's the nectar from the Manuka bush. Um, it's got a lot of properties around it. And it's only um, from the indigenous Maori people in New Zealand, but it's in New York, it's in London, it's in Paris, it's in all the big supermarkets because it is, the value of it is transportable and there are other people around the world who see that value and want it. And that, that's just something really special if you can get that right. It's like champagne. Okay, let's look at some of these. We're looking for authenticity, heritage, backstory, brands with a story that have been created along those um, authentic lines. So Red Espresso is one of ours, or, or not one of ours, but it's something from South Africa. Boss here, Roy Boss. Um, the Karoo, sitting there waiting to happen, something branded around the Karoo. Baobab, something we own here. Biltong is something we own here, but it's only being made famous as jerky in the States. You know, we're not branding these things. I mean, Biltong almost needs to get out of the, get the game and into the cool. You know, there's something that needs to happen about that. So we're looking for this. Okay, so handmade, small batch, premium. Where's our ice cream? That's really what we are trying to find as well. I'm going to just, because I, I want, don't want to talk all the time. I've got a little, um, your, talks about. You know what it takes to make jam? It should take just fruit, sugar, and lemon juice. And that's what people love like Zanny for. They make it in small batches and color times. And that's perfect for this. This is made with the blazed in flour. Something from the town of blazed in Gloucestershire arrived in the late 1880s. It ripens, uh, it ripens at the same time as the Victoria plum, sort of August, September, but it's redder on the outside, and inside, green and acidic. And it's that acidity that gives you the flavor. 
So not only made, that was a comedic thing, not only made the right way, but true old fashioned flavour, lays to one jam, and make it at all. Where do you have on the scope? So what we're looking, sorry, what we're looking at there is, um, it's exactly what you want in a jam. Um, you know, it's it's taking it out of the big food into the artisanal. Sustainable, also really important. Getting those, um, especially where you're dealing with an agricultural crop, getting those um, fair trades, oats, and making sure that there's sustainability in in what's happening with the product. Okay, so if we move on to key drivers and enablers, these are the things that bring these trends alive to the consumer. <clears throat> so we'll have a look at some of these. Home Chef. Um, a lot of products are being put out there which are, people are wanting to do everything, but not everything. So it's cooking with guidance. Um, half of it's been done for you in baking and waffle mixes and so on. Um, demi glass beef stock, you're not going to stand there cooking forever, but you want to add that wonderful flavor. So you're creating something, but you've got some things to help you along. Big, big opportunity. Digital food. Okay, this is, um, we have to start watching what's happening with 3D printers. I mean, those chocolates, they are made by a 3D printer. Um, we need to see how social media and Instagram are affecting food trends because everybody is... If you're on Instagram, you can be a complete um, professional in knowing what's happening in food trends. You just know who to follow and what to watch. Um, Life Q and Fitbit, you know, we all know they are measuring exactly what we need, how much we need to exercise, what we're doing. So all of that needs to be taken into account when developing food because people are so savvy. They're so understanding what they need to eat and what they need to do. Um, fabulous flavor. A lot of snacks and the, the blazing plum jam, you've got to deliver fabulous flavor. It's got to be out there. And we've seen a lot of playing with flavor, savory ice creams. Some of these, Joe and Seth's popcorn, is they've made gin and tonic popcorn. They've made um, the most amazing flavors that you would not expect. And it's wow, you want to try it. We all know sriracha, hot sauce. Why is it so amazing? Why is everybody wanting to eat it? And it's just something about it that has just got, they've got it right. Um, let me just see where we go next. Right, texture. This is something we also see coming up. A lot of product is being labeled as a texture. It is crunch. It is a chewy. It is something that is, um, it is what, you are going there and, buying that product because it gives you great texture. We thought this was quite a good example, the Simply Crispy Crisp Sandwich Cafe. I mean, we all know as South Africans the chip roll, where you've got a soft white roll and you stick Simba chips inside. They've actually created a restaurant that does that, does that with different flavors in Ireland. Um, so I thought, it was, I thought it was quite a find for the chip roll. Um, okay, we all, we've all heard about the millennials and what they have to do and what they're looking for and um, how they're different and how they're anti-status quo and all that sort of thing. But we need to really understand millennials to know what products to develop for them. We can't, take, we can't um, ignore the baby boomers. There's lots of money there and the digital natives because they're just coming up as well. So we always look at these shopping patterns and the, and the choices that people in these categories make. Packaging, everybody's questioning why we have so much plastic. Is it recyclable? Is it reusable? Does it compost? Can, and all those kind of things. And here are some, ex some extreme examples of products that, I mean, this um, Sun Chips packet is actually compostable. Nostalgia, it's, it comes out all the time where we see great big brands starting to, like Lint, starting to do some nostalgic product. We see some nostalgic um, flavors, apple and um, spice or apple and cinnamon. Those kind of things are all coming back, bone broth. Online, offline, the absolute value of being able to be a small entrepreneur making a product and just getting a website up there telling your backstory from day one. I mean, you can have three products, but you can really tell your story. Um, it's so important to be able to do that. 
and engaging with communities, you can actually engage with your, your customer immediately. Um, and then obviously in retail, how that uh, manifests itself. This is the last on, on this trend. We wanted to put it in, although it's not something we've seen in, in food packaged products, we've seen it in restaurants and QSR, where this is a picture of a McDonald's in Sydney. It's not called McDonald's. They haven't branded it McDonald's. It's called The Corner. And in there, you will go in and you will, you will feel like you're in a McDonald's, but there's no branding. And what you'll have is not a menu, but a list of options. So there's a big salad bar as you walk in, and then there are all the patties, different rolls. So you can get a pretzel roll or a, a crusty roll or a soft roll, and you make up your own burger. So all of the things that you love and know about McDonald's, but they're not prescribing to you as to what you should eat. They're letting you make your own choices. So it's, a, it's about these brands evolving um, and meeting with their customer base. They haven't rolled it out yet because I think it must be a bit of a nightmare, but it's there and it's in testing phase. So this, if I, we could just to end off here, because I need to just change over to a new presentation, but this is what we did about eight months ago. We, we looked at trends and we put this together to start seeing, because what we need to see is what is manifesting in product and what is actually going to take a lot longer, like cricket flour. It's going to take a lot longer for people to decide that they're going to eat this because it's high protein and it's, got, it's made with crickets. Um, but some of them we've already seen manifesting in themselves. So Bernard and I actually went to um, the Fancy Food Show in New York in June. And our, one of our main, um, we obviously went to have a look and see what was going on. But we had to take some of these trends and see how they were tracking in the U.S. So the next presentation is just a short time. I'm going to take you through some of our learnings when we looked at these products in the U.S. Okay, Bernard, do you want to? What? No? Okay. <laughs> okay, I just need to do a change here. Right. Okay, everybody's still all right. Right, so we went to the Fancy Food Show, July 2015. We needed, as I said, we needed to verify what we had seen and we needed to understand. We'd also just, um, um, we had also just invested in the bonbon, the confectionery. So we had to go and they came along with us. So they also were at the Fancy Food Show, Johannes and Jean, and we went along to look at products together and see where we were at, okay. It is a big show. It started off as being all about specialist retail and all about um, premium product. We're going to get to premium product and what that is today. But we did find at this show, um, with 2,500 exhibitors, that we couldn't get away from health and wellness. It was overarching in most everything we saw. Um, so our key insights, there it is, health and wellness overarching. Exhibitors were all small to medium, privately owned companies, and there were a few startups. So we were actually meeting some of the brand owners of the products eight months ago that we had pinned and put into our, um, into our trends. So it was great. We could actually go and talk to these people. Um, what, what we saw mostly was impressive quality. Small startups with such conviction, beautifully packaged, and you actually had the owner and the, and the founder sitting there talking to you about their product, and then you went to Whole Foods and you saw it there. So it was all about that. In the, although it was a lot of international exhibitors, we found that the US, and specifically New York and Brooklyn, were really high up on the innovation stakes there. Our highlights, brand, product, and people highlights. Gluten-free, conscious sugar, high protein. We saw it all there, main drivers. Small batch, owner created and run, simple and authentic with less ingredients. Those were key takeouts of products that were successful and had commercial pull through already. We looked very much at categories that we were interested in. Um, so confectionery was there, snacking, beverages, condiments and relishes, baking kits and yogurt, very big. So we looked at those big categories for us to look at. Now what I'm going to show you is a couple of brands that we picked up on where a lot of the, our philosophy was being played out in front of us. So Purely Elizabeth is largely a cereal brand, gluten-free. 
She started as a gluten-free expert 10 years ago. She's a celi celiac, um, so she has gluten intolerance, but she has become an absolute expert, but taken it into a commercial space. Um, we saw ancient grains um, done beautifully in her products, um, and she's all over in, uh, in the retailers there. Um, nutrient dense, high levels of protein and fiber, really, really wonderful range. Chocolati was interesting. It's a husband and wife team, tiny little shop in Chelsea, all handcrafted, beautifully packaged, um, but the real premium chocolate um, product that we saw there and such passion from, from them and built it into a big business, biggish business. Then we had to put this in because we have such um, a great product here, such a unique product in Biltong. But as I say, it needs to grow up into coolness. You can see jerky and meat snacks and meat bars and protein bars in the States have great penetration. They've, um, there's, there's so much happening there that is just exploding. And it's, if you think about it, it's the most portable protein snack you can actually do and you can actually have. But we, we haven't actually grown up into that yet. Um, Epic meat bars. It's an actual full meat, nut, and fruit all in one bar. Like you would normally buy a nut bar or a fruit bar. This is full of meat as well. Some of them great, <laughs> but some not so great. <laughs> but just a really cool story. Lovely packaging. Great people. Um, you can relate to them. There we go. Nut and seed butters, the energy squeeze. We had a good look at that. <laughs> Um, packed with protein, no additives, um, superfood, seeds, on-trend, reclosable squeeze packs. This is uh, a great trend for us to have a look at. There are some of the products we saw. Snack bars, nut and raw. Um, some of the great bars we saw there. Again, we met the people and we saw all the product in retail. So it was, it was great a validation of what we were seeing. Kind is one of, we're going to talk to you about the story of Kind in a minute, but it's one of the bars that we've, we've stayed very close to this one because we see um, it's 15 years of innovation that's sitting here and it's now become a really, really valuable brand. Um, and we'll tell you a bit about that story in a minute. Gourmet popcorn, um, it's almost become the new snack. It's healthier than a crisp and we saw such a lot of innovation there. Lots of girls involved in this um, whole area there you can see a lot of them funky and making it all happen um, skinny pop there we go make it um, so a lot of investment and stuff happening in this area as well all gluten-free only so many calories non-gmo no artificial anything ice creams and frozen desserts we looked at that very carefully as well there's lots of flavor there's lots of small batch slow churn it's all happening um, Savory versus sweet, premium, premium, premium. Coconut in everything, snacking, mayonnaise, ice lollies, baking mixes. It's like the new wonder food. Clean condiments, um, also very big. All the big brands are sitting up and taking note. Um, they've got to take sugar out. They've got to reduce sugar. They've got to clean it up, make it more, um, uh, more approachable. New Age barbecue and gravy, explosion in barbecue sauce, tomato sauce, um, all happening, all clean, small batch again. There's Heinz doing their bit to, to do some innovation. It's on a shelf in one of the supermarkets. Modern relishes, using sweet potato, using other bases, um, and lovely humor in all of the brands, bone sucking sauce, um, lovely stuff. Gut health, very cool, coming up in pickling, and you, you can see um, Brooklyn pickles in Woolworths also. Um, kombucha, very big. Baking kits, also very big. Cool, some cool brands. Um, better for you candy, gum, chocolates, nuts. Um, at the bottom, that sage lozenges, it's actually one product. A whole pharmacy almost um, set aside, but everything in sweets is going to botanicals and natural, less sugar, low sugar, no sugar. 
And this was a great brand for us. It's simply gum. It's actually made from, um, it's biodegradable. It's made from all those natural flavors in there. Um, organic sugar and organic ingredients. So, caramel, the new chocolate. We saw a lot of um, caramels happening. Lots of adult savory flavors like miso and so uh, soya and those kind of things. Chocolate, bean to bar, very big for us. Um, a lot of cocoa comes from Africa, yet all of this is being manifested in the US that people are doing the branding there and doing the chocolate libraries and so on. Chocolate's the new coffee. Um, this was a wall in a store in uh, New York called The Meadow. It only has four products in it, chocolate, salt, bar tinctures and flowers. That's it. And um, this was an entire wall. It looked like a library of chocolates. Um, saltwater taffy, another product which is um, comes from Brooklyn. New Age snacking, it's all about fruit. It's all about vegetables. It's about coconut and sprouted grains. Hummus everywhere, high protein, portable, easy to find, easy to carry around. Yogurt is growing up. Um, it's becoming savory, it's becoming lunchtime, breakfast time and the rest. Um, it's Greek, Nordic, all over. Um, beverages, we had to look, we need to look at beverages, we need to understand what's happening in the space with our inve investment in boss size tea. Um, cold brew coffee, we picked up on that a while ago. We didn't actually pin it as a trend because we thought it was just too hard to make and it wouldn't have value, but nope, it's out there. It's really, really out there. Iced tea, we look at iced tea, we look at what's going on in iced tea all the time. Some cool confectionery and snack brands we came across. Um, I'm just going to go through this quickly now. We always look at when a product stand over, stands out as innovation, it's almost creating its new category, its own category. Some of these were that. Here's Chirbani. Chirbani is a Greek yogurt. It's a brand story from farm to, it's actually now an actual store. It's just Greek yogurt and it's a store in New York. You go and you have Greek yogurt, some of it's flavored, some of it's plain, and you can add your own savory and your own sweet toppings. That's what it looks like inside um, and they're rolling them out. The Meadows, a store I spoke about earlier, it's really um, cutting edge. It's only got chocolate, salt, in big um, blocks on the floor, and bar tinctures. Through all categories, they see these as categories as being completely new and focused for innovation. Those were the fancy food top six, not very far from what we thought. This was actually what um, the, all the visitors to the fancy food show decided, that these were the top six products they saw there. Gazpacho on the go, pickles for gut health, some botanicals, uh, cocktail culture, maize, pop snacks. So, we now need to go forward and look at what we're looking at in the future. So what are the, some of the things we're tracking? Savory and bitter as flavors coming into categories where you wouldn't expect them. Uh, yogurt, ice cream, etc. Non-dairy, the emergence of nut milks and so on are going into yogurts and ice creams and so on. So traditional categories, but no dairy. African flavors, infusing, rooibos, boba, moringa, aloe, where can we take these flavors? Raw, raw in everything, not only as you would see in vegetables, but in anything you can make which is not cooked. People think that cooking is destroying nutrients, so what can we do with raw? We're looking at carbonated tea because we are um, in the tea business. We've got to put cold brew coffee up there. It's actually happening. It's out there. Colorings, colorings because we're looking at sweets with fruit and vegetables rather than um, artificials and sugar. Um, how do we handle this obsession with sugar now? Where it's hidden, where it's blatant, how do we, how do we actually cope with this? So we come to now to actually what the, the talk was about in the beginning and it's the war on big food. We've seen this, this is a Fortune uh, magazine article that came out a few months ago. Um, we've seen this across customers. There's a mounting distrust with big big food companies. They, they're being coined as the melting icebergs. So they're out there. They're looking to innovate. They're dinosaurs and they can't actually move fast enough. Consumers are seeking simple, authentic food with fewer ingredients. 67% of the growth in the food industry in 2014 came from small companies. 
came from innovation and small companies. And they are all um, made public and made known through social media. The consumer is looking for process, not for processing, but rather for cooking and rather for the recipe rather than the formulation. So there's a whole new speak happening in food. There's a whole new movement happening in food. And we believe that this is what the new premium is. This is what premium is today. So some of the values that we've put to premium, better for you, the kind product, snackification, we've taken a jerky or a cra um, crave jerky product there. Small batch, we've got the Le Bon Bon pot popcorn, which has now been launched in Woolworths. It's all about kettle popcorn, which is small batch, controlled. Each batch is made individually by hand, and that's the customer is wanting that. Clear, conscious labeling. If you're going to eat gum, why not eat the best gum? Why don't eat something that tells you exactly what's inside? Authenticity. We spoke about Manuka honey. It's an authentic product, but it's all over the world. Purity. We spoke about um, conviction. Um, purely Elizabeth being so known in, um, in gluten-free, an absolute expert in gluten-free, and she's just taken those principles and put it into a product. Dang is a thrice baked coconut chip which is only made um, with coconut sugar and salt. Um, it was born in a kitchen in Bangkok, it's now made in California and the coconuts are still grown in Bangkok. It's a, such a simple product but it has taken, the public has taken hold of it because it's so beautiful. Goodness, Sir Kensington Ketchup had huge investment recently. It's the fastest growing um, tomato sauce in the States but it is just clean, completely clean and made by a small company. So these are some of what we see as premium brand drivers. The customer is driving these qualities, is driving these qualities through the needs and, their, and the fact that they are so aware of what they are wanting. So this is where we see premium going in the future. It's not about the big companies and big food. So what are the challenges? The issues here is as small companies that are, or small entrepreneurs that are putting a, a, um, a product together, it's really understanding who this product is for, who's the customer, and what channel does that customer shop? Because you'll see the landscape in South Africa, especially around big retail like pick and pay and so on. I'm not knocking the giants, but they're all looking at rationalizing. They're all looking at going um, own label, white label, they're looking at uh, of going central distribution, central into their warehousing, making it simpler. How do they handle all of these tiny companies? How do they get this? So it's almost, we're saying, it's almost not the place to go when you've got something small. You need to connect with your customer in a smaller way. And therefore, what is the best route to market? This is the most difficult thing when you're a small company. Is where do you go and how do you get there? How do you get to your customer? How do you activate your brand? And how often do you need to innovate? Because we find a lot of small companies innovating a lot and spending a lot of money on innovation before they actually have pull through, before they actually, actually are going. And therefore, it's, they're struggling because they're spending all that money on innovation without actually getting to the route to market. So we put these challenges out there because we've seen that that is where um, our value sits in being able to invest in small brands sitting around the table and being able to help with some of these challenges. Because the small entrepreneur is focused on making the product, packaging the product, getting the invoice out, getting the money back, getting the product out there, understanding the customer. You're not looking at a strategy always. You're not being able to lift your head from the day to day. And when you start getting investment like that, you're almost forced to. You're forced to look at the bigger picture. You're forced to look at where you're going to go further down the line. So we're just putting it out there. That's kind of like where our value sits when we, when we look at investment. So I'm sure there must be questions. Yes. 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 Yes.
to become part of a bigger company or to yeah so I think what um, the two ways to answer this question I just want to go back to this because crave and kind and um, Sir Kensington all were sold into bigger companies quite recently yeah and kind um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll get that. But so those were all brands which were, which stood the test of time, had some pull through. But then, bigger companies that didn't have the innovation actually bought those brands. That's the one thing. The second thing is, if you look at the landscape here in South Africa, there are the food groups, and there are um, com investment companies or, or companies like Lipstar and so on who come in and take a majority share or, bu or building a food group or a food movement. But you become part of a bigger group and you're not always in, tro in, in control of your own brand and your own company. So without, um, our philosophy is to keep the entrepreneur in for a majority share because that is where you need to build and you need to be part of that build. We're not going to run the business, but we're going to supply um, the funding as well as some of the funding as well as the, um, the sounding board and the strategic value for you to be able to build your business but it's more important that you are in control and that you hold on to that and exit when you want to and you've actually built value because none of the big food companies are going to look at innovation unless there's a value to it or there's a story to it or there's some traction so how do you get from the product to having that value and that's a role that we are wanting to play is to be in that space um, to be able to build that value do you want to add to that? <laughs> 